All right, good afternoon and good morning to all of you on the West Coast. Uh, welcome to our webinar discussing the, the CARES Act, uh, Key Insights for Business Owners. My name is Tom Himmer, Vice President of Customer Development at Insperity. We're so excited to have all 2,000 plus of you join us today. That's right, 2,000 plus. I mean, can you believe it? We just sent the invite out uh, yesterday morning. We may have 3,000 people log in uh, before the end of the session. Thank you for uh, practicing uh, social distancing as well as physical distancing, and thank you for joining us today. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Just as a reminder, uh, participants are automatically muted uh, and you will not be on the screen. You can use your gallery to change your view at any time. If a panelist shares their screen, it will become uh, the main square so everyone can see it. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted as available for you to view at a later point. Uh, date. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, this is an important point. Please use the Q&A function, not the chat function if you have questions throughout the webinar. We will have Q&A at the end where select questions will be answered. Any questions that we don't get answered, we will follow up uh, directly after the webinar with answers to those questions. And at the end of this webinar, you will see a slide with contact information for you to reach out uh, to submit additional questions. Now, as all of you know, on Friday, March 27th, President Trump signed into law the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, Economic Security Act, or forever known as the CARES Act. The CARES Act is monumental in the breadth of relief it provides and the speed at which it intends to deliver that relief. This new legislation provides $350 billion to help small and medium-sized businesses keep workers employed. Today, we will discuss what we think is the cornerstone of the CARES Act, the Paycheck Protection Program, as well as other programs we feel you will find significantly uh, interesting. Make no mistake, this legislation was put together quickly, and the details and the pace at which things continue to evolve are coming at us quickly, and we're doing everything we can to interpret and bring you that information as soon as possible. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Kathleen Hillegas, Vice President of Government Affairs here at Insperity, and a group of experts from the firm of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek. Kathleen, I'm going to turn it over to you to tell us more about this wonderful group of experts that are joining us today. Thank you, Tom. And I'd like to say welcome to all of our guests on the webinar today. I hope your you, your family, and your friends are all well. And I am I'm really happy to be introducing the group of experts that we have here for you today from the law firm of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek. Um, they will be providing the expert analysis. I want to give you just a little bit of background on the firm. Um, Brownstein has offices in 13 cities, including Atlantic City, Denver, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Orange County, Sacramento, San Diego, and of course, Washington, D.C. They provide expert legal advice to multiple business sectors um, and provide background on the public policy, driving laws, and the implementation of the laws. I'd like to thank a couple members of their team that will not be presenters today, but are essential to the effort. First of all, Lori, how are you? Lori is Congressman Kevin Brady's former chief of staff. She also advised Mr. Brady when he chaired the House Ways and Means Committee, which of course is the tax writing committee in the House. Um, she knows how the system works inside and out and has been very helpful, <clears throat> excuse me. And then there's Charlie Ivino. Um, Charlie has years of experience interpreting public policy and laws and how they work together and the complex woven fabric that they become. And she is scary smart. Um, so thank you both for your assistance. Now to the stars of the hour. Um, Reese Goldsmith comes to Brownstein from the SBA's Office of Advocacy. As we know, the SBA is the agency that is overseeing the implementation of many of the relief programs in the CARES Act. Then we have Radha Mohan. Um, Radha is a legislative and regulatory strategy savant. She knows the law, she knows the policy, she knows how they fit together. And then of course, there is Russ. If you are on the, it dialed into the webinar for the sound check, um, you will recognize Russ as the sound of God, which is somewhat appropriate. Um, Russ chairs the firm's National Tax Policy Group. He made Capitol Hill his home for over a decade. Much of that time was spent working with the Senate Finance Committee, 
which of course is the Senate Tax Writing Committee. Um, he is what is known in DC as something of a big deal. Um, I thank you all for spending time to talk about these important opportunities that are included in this historic emergency relief legislation. Its scope is very broad, and yet much of it is interwoven. Um, it raises many questions, some of which we are still waiting for answers for from the, from the government. But um, this group of experts will help us navigate it. And with that, I'll turn it over to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. And good day, my friends from across the country. We are honored to be here today and to help you understand more about the CARE Act. We are going to move quickly through many of these slides that you're going to be seeing. Uh, and but hopefully we will answer a lot of the questions that you have. First, let's start off with what was Congress trying to do? Well, you know in general what they were trying to do. Number one, they were trying to help workers either keep their jobs or get some prompt temporary assistance until the pandemic recedes. Uh, this is applying to full-time, part-time workers. Uh, they did a number of things, including an unprecedented $600 per week increase in unemployment benefits. Uh, they also uh, are giving rebates to individuals you've heard about and gave workers access to some of their savings account as a bridge. But they also uh, really spent more time and more focus trying to help the businesses who currently employ those individuals. And particularly, they were focused on small businesses, helping them survive the adverse consequences of the virus and the social distancing protocols that have been put into place. Of course, you know that uh, there are different kinds of assistance and some are better than others. So there are some provisions in here that are as, can economically be a grant. That's the best thing for a small business. There are also some refundable tax credits that don't cost anything to get. And so those are helpful as well. They uh, expanded some creative cost sharing arrangements for workers whose hours are reduced. And there are some loans uh, through various means, including the deferral of tax payments that you have to make or the acceleration of tax refunds that you are gonna get eventually anyway. So let's dive into these. We have four main categories uh, for our webinar agenda. First, we have the liquidity. How do we make sure that businesses have enough money to pay their bills, to pay their workers, and uh, to move forward to survive until this pandemic uh, is on the wane? We're gonna spend about half of our time in this category here today, maybe perhaps a little bit more. Second, we're gonna talk about employee retention and some provisions that were designed to encourage employers, if at all possible, to keep as many employees on the payroll as they can at their current salary. Okay, the third category would be employee benefits and uh, some, some ideas that were included in this and some previous legislation a week or two ago uh, to provide these benefits to workers, particularly in the healthcare space. And finally, some tax benefits that companies, regardless of their structure, corporate or pass-through, might be able to take advantage, advantage of. So now let's move on. Let's jump into the liquidity portion. I'm on page eight of the, of the deck. The most uh, generous provision and the one that your questions in advance of this webinar express the most interest in is the Paycheck Protection Program. What is this? This is an expanded SBA loan. SBA has always uh, been, been there for small businesses through a variety of loans. This one is by far the largest. If all the funds are subscribed, it will be twice as much as the maximum amount of outstanding SBA loans there have ever been in history. So, and it's moving beyond SBA. It's gonna give unprecedented roles to the, to the financial institutions Treasury is involved and they're doing everything they can to expedite. So what is it? Who, el who is eligible? Well, if you already got an SBA loan, you are eligible for this. But you don't have to have had an SBA loan in order to do that. The legislation authorizes Section 501c3, nonprofits, veterans organizations, tribal small business concerns, and essentially any company with 500 or fewer employees. 
And you don't have to have a large number of employees, sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed individuals, or businesses with only two or three employees and uh, are eligible as well. So then you may say, most of you may actually uh, control your company and it's limited to under 500. So you say, great. But some, uh, a lot of an increasing number of small businesses are now affiliated with larger organizations. Some of them are owned by private equity firm or uh, some other corporation. And so the question comes, what if uh, the business is affiliated with some larger business? Does that disqualify me? Does, is there some special affiliation test? Well, this is one area where the law is not fully clear. The, the SBA does have a set of affiliation tests that are in the statute and have been around for a number of years. The, the legislation, however, put in a few provisions to waive these affiliation tests. They did it for hospitality and restaurant industries that fall under NICS code 72. They waived them for franchises that are on the franchise directory and businesses who receive financing through the Small Business Investment Company program. Um, Russ, may I interject? Certainly. Um, sure. So um, the, the NI, um, NAIC or S or NAICS code, um, that is an industry classification system, the North American industry classification system. And that is the classification system that will tell you if you're already an existing eligible small business. And then what the, um, what the CARES Act does is expand it from the already existing NAICS code. And then they've created a, a special carve out of the affiliation rules for NAICS code 72. So I just wanna make that clear um, before you move on. Great. So what are these SBA affiliation rules? Let's look at slide 11. So the SBA rules say, that uh, you may have to, for purposes of determining whether you've got 500 or more employees, 500 and fewer, you may have to affiliate with another organization. One of the tests is stock ownership. If there's an entity that controls 50% or more of your voting stock, and it is not you, uh, you very well may be affiliated with that organization. There can be even examples where the voting stock is widely held, but there's one dominant stockholder. You may have to uh, affiliate with that organization. Second, stock options, convertible securities, and agreements to merge are taken into account. If your entity has agreed to merge with someone else, you're likely to have to include the employees from both of those organizations to compute whether you're eligible. If there's common management, if there are a few board members and a CEO who hold similar positions, similar ownership in two organizations, you may be affiliated. In addition, there's some other tests that sort of are presumptions. They don't mean you're necessarily affiliated, but it sort of opens the door to a facts and circumstances test. If there's an identity of interest between various individuals and businesses, including family members, if you're a newly organized uh, concern, but so supported by someone else, or if you're parties to a joint venture, then you've got to look very closely to see if you're gonna be caught up in these affiliation rules. Because if you are affiliated and the affiliation will put you over 500 employees, you're not gonna be eligible for this uh, paycheck protection loan. Now, I say that we have not seen the guidance yet as to how this will work. And if uh, the SBA and the Treasury Department are working with the spirit of this legislation of trying to get uh, credit and cash out to all of our small business in the U.S., they may take it to you and, and somehow allow uh, those entities who might be affiliated under SBA law to not be affiliated for purposes of the Paycheck Protection Program. But looking at the law itself, it doesn't seem to be too much wiggle room. Russ, when do you expect that Treasury and SBA will come out with these guidelines? Well, Secret Treasury Secretary Mnuchin promised they would be out this week. He said he wanted the banks to start uh, approving loans Friday. 
and he actually promised this guidance would be out yesterday. I continue to check the SBA website. Haven't seen it yet. Maybe it'll come up during this webinar. Certainly, I expect it to come this week sometime. All right. So hey, Russ. Start. Russ, one, one, quick, one quick question. Yes. Um, this is Tom. So at Insperity, we have a lot of clients that are uh, part of a private equity structure or some venture capital structure where they're part of a, 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 port, a group of portfolio companies held by a private equity group. Uh, what would your advice be to those customers uh, in order to verify whether they are subject to an affiliation or not? Well, uh, the easiest way is if they could determine if they're in uh, code 72. Uh, and that would be the easiest way to proceed and, and be sure that they could qualify. Absent that, they may need to dig into the SBA rules for affiliation uh, and may need to contact uh, their member of Congress or uh, someone else, the bank that they work with, they might get some guidance on that uh, before. So one thing to add to that, it does look like Speaker Pelosi and Representative Khanna are circulating some language with regards to that. There are many, especially in Silicon Valley, that have expressed that the SBA rules are overly strict um, in terms of the application of, of, of the affiliation rules. And they have indicated um, that it's their impression that a slightly looser uh, construction should be looked at for those that are backed by VC or private equity. Yeah, and I think Rada, the, the House version of this legislation, which never got considered, yeah. actually did have a much more generous a rule that allowed companies that may be affiliated in the SBA rules to qualify in any of it. So if, if it can't get expanded through regulatory and implementation processes, it may very well get expanded in the next piece of legislation. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so how much uh, can you borrow? The CARES Act uh, authorized $350 billion in these interruption loans. And the legislation says, Look, for any individual business, $10 million is the maximum here. Uh, the rules uh, are, are much more detailed on the specific amount. The, the loan proceeds for any individual company is equal to 250% of the average month's payroll cost, or two times one month's payroll cost. In computing that, there are lots of rules. Let me hit a few of them. Uh, number one, any compensation uh, for an employee who makes over $100,000 is not taken into account. So if you have an employee and she makes $160,000 total compensation, you would count $100,000 toward uh, her salary or compensation for figuring out her annual salary. Then you back it up to a month and multiply it times 2.5. Let's go to a specific example, a simple example of the Insperity coffee shop who has uh, an owner and six employees. Uh, on this chart, we've listed the annual compensation of each of these individuals and then divided it by 12 so you can figure out what is their monthly pay. And just assuming that they paid equivalently throughout the year to make it simple. You can see for this company, their total amount of one month's compensation adds up to $28,666. Once you have that amount, you multiply it times 2.5, and this, the resulting amount, 71,665, is the amount that that business, the Insperity Coffee Shop, could apply for and receive a loan under the Paycheck Protection Program. Now, I know all of you in the HR field are saying, Russ, you got to define compensation because there's 18 different things that go into it. Well, fortunately for small businesses, the definition is fairly broad. It, it, the defined term is payroll costs and it includes wages, commissions, bonuses, tips, includes the taxes that are paid on the employee's wages. It includes the cost of the employer contribution toward the health care plan, any vacation, sick leave, that the individual has, that counts as well. So how do you measure this? Well, the law says that for most people, you will measure your average 
uh, compensation for your workers, your payroll costs, for the 12 months prior to the origination date of the loan, when it's approved, okay? So, as you might tell, you may want to think about if you're going to apply for a loan, pulling that information together, even at this point. If, however, you are a new business, you have a special rule. If you weren't in existence in 2019, particularly between February 15th and June 30th, then you just do a two-month period test, January to February 2020, and use that to calculate your average monthly amount. Now, uh, how complicated that is, is that? Probably pretty complicated. Uh, fortunately, you may have someone who can help you here. I don't know, Tom, is there anybody who can help them? <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Russ. So uh, if for those of you on the, on the call for our Insperity customers, uh, we are working, we have been working diligently over the last few days to develop a report for you. And, and the, the up-to-date uh, information I have for you is tonight, after hours, we are going to go live with a report on the Insperity Premier landing page and it's going to be called the CARES Act, Paycheck Protection Loan. And it's going to be a link that you're going to be able to click. And it's going to take you to a place where you can run a self-service report for the date range that you need. Uh, and that report is going to include all of the aspects that have been included in the, in the legislation as it relates to what's included in, in payroll costs. It will also include the portion of the Insperity Comprehensive Service Fee that would be included in what would be uh, payroll costs. Now, there is a couple of caveats to that. Uh, this assumes that you've participated in all of our programs, so our benefits, our 401k program. If you are out there participating with outside plans around those, you will need to add that uh, to whatever the numbers that it's, the Insperity Report provides. There are three, Russ, we've created three types of, uh, basically there's three categories of, of reports. Uh, certainly, one is we have clients that have been with us for the whole year. Uh, those are clients where they'll be able to run that report and they will be able to determine what their payroll costs are for that entire period of 2019. There are clients that may have joined us um, over the course of the last 12 months, and this report obviously will only give you information for as long as you've been with Insperity. You will also need to go back and you'll need to uh, aggregate whatever the payroll costs are with whomever you uh, process payroll or, or other plans that you may have been associated with before being with Insperity. So again, I don't wanna to take too much time. There will be a link on your Insperity Premier landing page tomorrow morning uh, where you'll be able to go out and run the report and it will provide you with the information that you need uh, as, as well as of these other places where you may need to go and add uh, some additional um, numbers for the, to do the math for calculating average monthly payroll. Great, Tom, I wish Robert. I could say promise the same for the SBA, that they would have their application on their website <laughs> launching pad by tomorrow morning, but I'm not gonna make that promise here today. All right, Good. so let's say you figured it out you, and you qualify for a $71,665 loan. And let's say they do process it quickly, like Secretary Mnuchin has said, and within three days, you get a wire to your account. And in many cases, uh, Entities who get loans have multiple purposes for it. They may want to spend part of it and they may want to save part of it. Uh, this is a different kind of loan. There is no incentive for you to save any of the $71,665 because if you do, you have to pay it back. But if you spend it on the right things, you will get that loan forgiven. So what can the proceeds be spent on that then I make it eligible for a forgiveness or conversion into a grant. Well, uh, the goal of this program was actually to provide about eight weeks of payroll costs. But you've already heard me say you get to use a 2.5 month multiplier here. So you're gonna get more money than just your payroll costs for two months. The Congress said we, we understand that and we want you to provide a little cushion for you to spend money on other things particularly if you have lost some members of your staff since it, it began for various reasons. So what can you spend the money on? You can spend it on the payroll costs that we just described before that go into the computation of your, um, uh, your top amount of loan that you can qualify for. Uh, your group health care benefits, your salaries, compensation. You can also include rent 
utility cost and a mortgage payment if you own the property and are paying on a mortgage that was in existence prior to February the 15th. If you have any other debt obligations that were incurred before February 15th, you may be able to include that as well. So Congress really did set this up that if you're trying to keep most of all your employees, you, you, you will be able to spend the money in the next uh, two months, in the next eight weeks, and actually then have the loan forgiven. So how does that uh, work? All right, partial loan forgiveness and maybe full is provided uh, if you use the loan for these eligible purposes. There is a, the period ends eight weeks beginning on the date of the loan origination. So if you get your loan on April the 8th, then you have six weeks from then taking you into early June in order to spend the $71,655. If, however, you either conduct layoffs or you reduce some of your employees' compensation, you might not get all of your forgiveness. Uh, and you may have to pay some at the end of that. These are quite complicated rules that we're not gonna go into in detail today, but let me give you a, a cup, a little vision of this. One is, a, is an FTE test, full-time equivalent, and you can compare before you got the loan to the date uh, toward the end of the period. Even if for some reason you uh, did have a reduction in workforce, if because of these proceeds, you're able to rehire those individuals by June 30th, that will not count against you. You won't have your, uh, your loan uh, stay uh, in, in place. Instead, you could potentially get full forgiveness. Second, if you've reduced any individual employee's compensation by 25% or more, then uh, those amounts will be uh, put into a formula that will have a slight haircut on your uh, forgiveness uh, eligibility. However, again, if you increase their pay back to the, the beginning point uh, by June 30th, you and will meet the safe harbor test. Now we get to the good part. What are the terms of the loan? Well, the terms of the loan are, hey, maximum of 10 years, but they really don't want anybody or very few people to be in a 10-year loan. They want these to be forgiven. What's the interest rate? Uh, probably 4%, but there is a six-month uh, deferral of interest payments on this loan. And the idea is that the loan will be forgiven before you ever have to pay any interest. Uh, there are no fees like there are on most other SBA loans. There's no credit elsewhere test. There's no collateral. There's no security. It's, there's no personal guarantee by an executive of your company. Uh, instead, it's the federal government who's guaranteeing this loan, and that's what makes these banks willing to process these loans. They get an origination fee for each loan that they process, and they will be incentivized to process as many as they can. So how do you apply? Well, SBA-approved banks are going to process these loan applications on behalf of SBA and the Treasury. Depending on where you live, we don't know. It may all be done online. You may not have a single meeting, even with your bank. You're certainly not going to have a meeting with the SBA or the Treasury Department in this process. They're going to add banks because what they're going to quickly uh, find out is they've got more applications than they, pro that they can process. For you, I would suggest you call your banker and ask, ask your bank if they are S SBA approved or preferred lender try to get in the queue. Uh, we have uh, talked to many of bankers in the cities that are our clients, and most of them say they expect that those who, current, who have dealt with the SBA before are likely to get the faster processing because they already have the data on those. So what can you do now? Prepare that payroll computation. Figure out your 12-month average payroll cost. Have it documented. Uh, and, and everything else related to it uh, to be able to provide to your bank. So that's the essence. What have I missed? I think you captured most of it, Russ. Um, hey, Russ, this is Kathleen. If you're Kathleen. Kathleen. Yes, I only had one, one item. When you were talking about the affiliation rules, um, I, I just want to point out that for purposes of a PEO relationship, the affiliation rules are very clear that a PO client does not have to affiliate or add the number of the 
um, total PEO employees when determining if they're eligible under the SBA. In other words, um, your, your eligibility as far as employee count um, rests with the business, um, not with the PEO. Yeah, yes, Kathleen, I'm so I'm so happy you mentioned that. Uh, we had a, there's a lot of questions that were coming through on the Q and A on that. Hey, Russ, one other one other really before we leave the PPL program, there's a question on here that's really resonating with a lot of folks, and that is, um, how long will it take to for for uh, to be these loans to be processed, and is the application process different uh, than the uh, EIDL program that's also out there? Um, uh, that is a good question. I think, um, I think that uh, it's unclear how long uh, the, the process will be, but it could take, um, you know, 60 days of the underwriting process, but I think we're still waiting for those, those guidelines. Um, so okay. if you do need a, a, a cash injection, the EIDL loan. Uh, are actually being administered directly through the SBA rather than through an SBA lender. Um, and then uh, uh, and when we kind of move on to the EIDL loans, I think the, the best, um, the highlight of that is that you can, in addition to your payroll cost calculation, you can also then also wrap in that uh, Paycheck Protection Program loan, you can take that out and use it to also cover whatever you took out with the EIDL. And but Reese, yeah. 60 days is not going to happen. Yeah, it. it's not. So Secretary Mnuchin has been very clear. He wants these to be processed like within a matter of days, like three days, four days, the same week that you apply. Yeah. Now, I, I agree with you. That's going to be a challenge. But if, if the process takes 60 days, that won't work for for virtually any small business in America. Right. Yeah. So correct. they've got to come out with a, a streamlined version that either allows the banks to approve the loan without any signal from the SBA that it's approved, mm -hmm. and with some protections for them against making a mistake. And and that's what I expect to actually happen, right. so that it can be very swift. Yes, my understanding is. Right. They are trying to make this much more streamlined than the traditional 7A program and make the application um, at one page, if possible. And for the EIL yeah. program, you would be able to at least technically access it within three days. So if you need mm -hmm. a quick cash infusion, apply for the EIL, EIDL program, and then move through the SBA uh, through the uh, Paycheck Protection program. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Reese, go ahead with anything else on the EIDL. Sure. Um, so the EIDL um, grants, they've provided an extra $10 billion in funds um, for the EIDL. And again, you apply uh, through, through SBA.gov for these. It's also a, a streamlined application process. Um, and then the CARES Act allows for um, uh, an initial amount of 10,000 in three days um, and certain requirements are waived for less than 200,000. Um, and again, you can later uh, wrap this into your 7A paycheck uh, protection program loan. Um, so they also expanded eligibility um, for EIDLs, um, they they did not waive the affiliation rule. I'm the way I read it, they didn't waive the affiliation rule for EIDL um, grants. But um, businesses, cooperatives, uh, employee stock ownership plans, tribal small business concerns with fewer fewer than 500 employees, um, sole proprietors, and independent contractors and um, private nonprofit organizations and small agricultural cooperatives are um, also eligible in addition to traditional small business concerns. So they did try to expand eligibility as well for these EIDL grants. Um, All right, so Reese, what if, what if you've already got an SBA loan? Maybe it's enough to cover uh, 
what do you do? What kind of benefit of year? Is your only choice to roll it in for a big PPP loan or uh, can you get some kind of deferral of your payments on your existing? Sure, so the, um, the CARES Act also provides um, an additional 17 billion for uh, deferrals of existing SBA loans. Um, so um, this is for 7A loans uh, that are not um, Paycheck Protection Program loans, 504 loans, and micro loans. Um, and you can... Um, the deferral period is six months minimum right. all the way up to a year. Is that right, Rita? Correct. Um, so you can elect to do that. Um, and then um, you can also separately apply and take out a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, but debt relief under this program doesn't apply to a paycheck protection loan. Um, so again, that deferral period is for six months and can also last up for a year or up to a year. Um, and um, you can also apply this to a new, uh, a, a new borrower, but you can't apply it to those. So. Okay, those are the SBA uh, loan provisions. Now let's move on to ones that are a little more within your control and don't involve the SBA. The largest one is a deferral of a portion of the payroll taxes that you pay on your employer. The law says that the employer portion of OASDI, the 6.2%, uh, you can actually defer for the rest of the year. There are a couple of problems here or limitations. If you're going for the Paycheck Protection Program and you're successful, you can't do the deferral. I'm not sure why they did that. I guess the theory is that if you're getting a grant that you're gonna pay your employees, you shouldn't get to defer the tax on those as well. I think they're two separate things and they should have uh, allowed both, but the law does not allow both. It also doesn't allow deferral uh, if you've entered into one of these short-time compensation agreements with respect to those employees. So how does it work? Uh, the employer may delay payment of all 100% of this 6.2 employer share of Social Security, uh, part of FICA. And you can continue doing it through the end of 2020. Self-employed individuals get a similar amount. They get 50% uh, because they're paying both the employer and employee share. They get to basically defer the employer share. It's not actually clear what happens if you wait to get a PPP loan and you don't apply till May and you actually have the opportunity in April to defer payroll taxes. The law is silent on how that works. Uh, I think they're gonna be generous. So if for some reason you anticipate you're gonna wait, I would go ahead and defer your payroll taxes for the next few uh, payrolls. So when do you have to pay it back? Well, this is about a one to two year uh, deferral or loan. You have to pay back 50% of whatever you deferred through the end of 2020, 50% of it by December 31st, 2021, 50% by December 31st, 2022. There is no interest on this deferral uh, and you are protected through the statute. It is as if you actually made deposits of these amounts, but there's no way you could be subject to penalties or interest. All right, but what's not covered here, be careful. You, you don't want to claim too much. The HI portion, the 1.45% is not covered. And the employee share, all of these is not covered. So make sure you only stick to the 6.2%. Now, let's go back to our example, the Insperity Cafe, Coffee Shop. All right, so in their particular item, I took one month's wages from that chart, and it was 28 six, that was the total wages that were subject to OASDI. So we, you'll multiply that by 6.2%, comes out to 1,777. You can delay that monthly uh, payment of OASDI on those wages for nine months for a total of 15,995. And you may say, eh, that's not that much, but that's for a, a cafe or a coffee shop that has only six employees. You have a lot more, the benefit to you is a lot greater. So. Hey, Russ? Yes. 
Uh, this is Tom. I, I would like to insert here. So for those Insperity clients that uh, uh, are on the uh, webinar with us, we are actively and, uh, frankly, working quickly uh, to try to adopt and, uh, and implement technology changes in order to be able to handle uh, any clients that choose to take the payroll uh, tax deferral. So be expecting information on that from us shortly, uh, but you, can, uh, you will see that, uh, uh, and we are actively trying to make that happen for all the clients that are, that are with Insperity. Great. Now you're going to hear about a big fund that the Federal Reserve and Treasury are organizing. Uh, it's called Different Things at Different Times. You may hear it called the Main Street Fund for larger businesses. It is a, a, a facility that's set up to actually lend money to individual companies. Again, the loans will be made by banks, and then once the loan is made, it will be sold to the, basically the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. Uh, it, there's very broad discretion, much more discretion than the SBA loans as to how to run this program and who to lend to. Uh, it's allocated $450 billion for this, but the Federal Reserve is going to kick in maybe as much as $2 trillion additional dollars for this program. However, I'm going to be honest with you, unless you're pretty big, you're, you're going to have be frustrated trying to get one of these loans, and you may not want to anyway. There are a number of strings attached. You cannot do any stock buybacks while the loan is outstanding plus an additional year. You can't grant any dividends while the loan is outstanding, uh, plus an additional year. Executive compensation must be retained. Anyone over $425,000 a year can't have an increase for the life of the loan. Uh, and now, while the Treasury Secretary can waive these requirements, I doubt he will. And if he does, he's going to be hauled up to Congress before the Democrats to explain why he did so. So there may be additional uh, strings attached to that as well. I don't think very many businesses, at least initially, with less than 500 employees, are going to be able to get their bankers to focus on them for this loan. In fact, Treasury uh, Fed put out a term sheet saying they were looking for investment grade debt, triple uh, A, triple B, uh, and most small businesses aren't even uh, rated. So set that to the side for now, uh, unless you're affiliated with a large organization and your large organization may be. Now let's talk about other provisions. The employee retention tax credit uh, is the next one, and I call this the consolation prize. Yeah, you, you're you're going to claim the employee retention tax credit if you don't get your PPP. So if you uh, it's determined you are affiliated with a large organization or your computation of your employees ends up over 500, you're not eligible. Uh, you're not all out of luck you're gonna be able to take a credit that's gonna give you up to $5,000 per employee that you retain on the payroll and continue to pay during this period for the rest of this year. Uh, it is a little simpler than the SBA, uh, but it won't give you the benefit. We've run a number of examples and it ranges, of course, depending on your size, but it could be you know, maybe a quarter of the benefit that you would get from the SBA loan. Uh, it runs in that range. Technically, it's 50% of the qualified wages, uh, but each individual employee has a maximum of 10,000 in wages that can qualify for this. Uh, you can't get it if you're also um, benefiting from the new FMLA tax credit or the paid sick leave tax credit. Again, it is refundable, fully refundable, initially against those payroll taxes that we talked about deferring, OASDI taxes. But even if it's more than that, uh, in your case, the Treasury and the IRS will actually send you a check, so it is fully refundable. So who's eligible to this? Is it everybody? Well, it might be. It might not be. We'll see. Here's the definition. It says, any employer carrying on a business in the quarter, if the trader business is fully or partially suspended as a direct result of COVID-19 and some government uh, edict saying, hey, you need to shut down for these hours. You need to not let people eat, sit down and eat in your restaurant. You need to close it down entirely. Or if your gross receipts are, are, have plummeted by at least 50% compared to last year for this comparable period, then you're eligible here. I think a broad range of entities are gonna be eligible under this as well. And uh, a 501C organization doesn't have to be 501C3, 
like the Paycheck Protection Program loan, any 501c organization is eligible for this. So there are different rules for larger than smaller companies. If you have 100 or less, you're gonna get all the wages uh, for the employees if you've had a partial or, or a complete suspension of business. If you have more than 100, there's a harder test, which is you can't count employees who are still providing services. They're probably trying to get mostly at lawyers and accountants here who can take their laptops home and can work remotely from home just as well as they can in the office. But we're not sure how much more they will cover in this type of situation. And honestly, I'm sure all of you could give us an example of employees where they're gonna do some work from home, but they're certainly not gonna do as much as they could have done at the office. I think in those cases, uh, you're probably gonna end up with a partial credit eligibility for those individuals, although we have nothing tangible in writing yet that says that. So who is your employee? Uh, anyone treated as a common employee for tax purposes. So independent contractors, no, but any employee full or part-time is what we're talking about here. Again, can't get it and the Paycheck Protection Program. There's another option for you, not a tax credit, but it's a new, newer arrangement called short-time compensation arrangement. Rada? Yep, sure. So short-time compensation programs are essentially programs that allow you to reduce the number of hours that your employee would work in lieu of laying them off. So it's a really great employee retention tool for those of you that don't want to eliminate your employee entirely, but want some assistance from the state government to pay a portion of their reduced salary. There are 26 states um, that do currently have operational short-term compensation or short-time compensation programs. And in these states, it's particularly a benefit because the federal government will fund 100% of state benefits that are paid under this program, which basically means that if you reduce your employee's um, number of hours worked um, by say 20%, the state will pay a portion of those unemployment, a reduced portion of those unemployment benefits while you will pay a, a portion of their wages. So you will have a little bit of assistance from state governments to retain employees. And in a minute, we can walk through um, the examples over there. Now, what happens if you're in one of those states where you don't have an existing short-time compensation ar arrangement? Well, in that case, the state actually needs to enter into an arrangement um, with the company and agree to, to um, adopt this program. If they do that, then the federal government gives them a little bit of an incentive to adopt this program by agreeing to cover 50% of the state's costs. However, if you're in one of those states that doesn't have the program, you will have to pay 50% of the state benefit. I think As a practical matter, Rada, if a state doesn't have a program up and running now, is that going to help our businesses here? They've got to make decisions now no. about what they're doing. Um, but, you know, it will probably take states a few weeks to figure this out. So this is not immediate relief for you. Um, we can walk through an example really, oh, okay. If, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and, and we can walk you through some examples offline. But in essence, if you, if you work on an arrangement where the employee is going to work 80% rather than 100% of the time, then you, the employer pays the 80%, and then the state will come in through this kind of program and pay part of that other 20%. Exactly. Right? Maybe exactly. half. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay. Um, in addition to short time compensation programs, you do have regular unemployment benefits as well. The centerpiece of that program is what Russ mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation. Um, most people who are directly impacted by COVID-19 will be, a, 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 will be um, a, eligible for an additional $600 a week benefit that runs all the way through July 31st. Now, that's particularly beneficial because if you do have low wage workers, um, this will essentially allow them to collect unemployment benefits over and above their current compensation limit. So it's in addition to 100% of compensation. So there is a little bit of an added benefit over there for certain um, folks. 
the other two things that the unemployment compensation law does is it waives a state one week state waiting period that states normally impose. States do need to agree to waive the waiting period, but many have already done so. In those cases, unemployment benefits will start immediately. The final benefit to be aware of is, especially if you're in states like Florida and North Carolina or Missouri, where you have a shorter um, unemployment benefit uh, uh, you know, eligibility period, what the federal do law does is essentially allow eligibility for up to 39 weeks of unemployment compensation. Um, I think that is, again, one of the major benefits to folks who are in states that, that, don't ne that aren't necessarily in line with the rest of the country. All right, what about uh, employee benefits paid by the companies? What's happening here? We had a bill a week or two ago about paid sick leave and FMLA leave. I hope folks have already sort of digested part of that. We're not gonna go through all of that, but this, this bill, this CARES Act also modified some of that, right, Rana? It does. So I will go through a very high level overview of that. In terms of sick leave, if you've got under 500 workers, you get 80 hours um, of sick leave that you have to provide for your employees. If they are subject to a state, federal, local quarantine, if they have to stay home because they might have COVID-19 or are experiencing um, or, or seeking a medical diagnosis. And for those folks, the amount of compensation cannot exceed 511 a day um, for 10 days a week. Or, sorry, for a total benefit period of, of 10 days. So this is a mandate on small businesses. Yes which historically have been an anathema on Capitol Hill yes. uh, during the period we worked up there. But uh, this is in the law now. It doesn't apply to big employers above five, just the small employers. Exactly. So how did they get that passed? <laughs> well, two things. There is a credit that you're eligible for, right? So essentially up to that $511 amount um, for the reasons that I just stated, you are eligible for a 100% credit against, 100% refundable credit against payroll taxes um, for that 511 amount. Now, there is one wrinkle in that. If, you, if your employee needs to be out to care for a sick child or um, is out because they're caring for someone who's sick with COVID-19, then the benefit amount is reduced to $200 a day again, for a total benefit period of 10 days. Now, I want to make clear, if you want to pay your employees more than that, nothing's stopping you from doing that. It's just your credit amount for paid sick leave will be capped at the 511 or 200 a day. Good. All right, and wasn't there a rule in there that you can't change the policy about what it is sick leave? So. There is a rule about that, today. so after enactment, um, can't make certain changes to sick leave, FBI, to, to all of those other, um, policies. And that's essentially, it's an anti-abuse Okay, and when is the city? This hey, hey, Russ. Um, uh, policy hey. is in effect starting in April, so starting April 1st you would essentially be um, eligible for the credit. If you did pay some wages before then, you are not eligible for the credit, unfortunately. And is the paid family medical leave print, you know, basically the same principle? Basically the same principle. That allows um, a maximum leave period of about 12 weeks. The first two weeks will run concurrently with your state, with the state sick leave portion. Um, again, this is mostly for use if you're unable to work because you're caring for a child who has, uh, who, whose school is closed due to COVID-19 precautions. So. Okay, let me hit a couple of other benefits. Uh, hey, Russ, real quick, I did want to jump in. This is Tom. So from a, just for the Insperity clients that are on the line, uh, we are finalizing technology development for this paid sick leave, uh, and it will be out very soon. So. Rest assured, the development is currently underway. We're getting close to finalizing. And for any of these type of sick leave benefits, uh, that will be completed and rolled out to our clients very soon. 
great. First, for workers uh, who need to access their 401k plan or other retirement uh, defined contribution accounts, the legislation eliminates the 10% early distribution penalty. It's waived for virtually any withdrawal this year, it looks like, for the rest of this year, for up to $100,000. And now, you do have to include it in income, but for the first time, at least that I can recall, uh, they're going to spread that out over, over up to a three-year period of the taxpayer's election. And again, there'll be a recontribution provision if taxpayers want to do that as well. Uh, similarly, it increases the amount of loans one can take from her or his plan, up to $100,000. Most plans have a maximum of $50,000 in the vested amount. It's going up to $100,000, uh, and it actually delays many of the payments on outstanding loans that currently exist. So you may want to tell your workers about those benefits as well. The other benefit that is available to all of you for your employees is a student loan repayment benefit. So essentially, up to $5,250 if during this period of time you want to go ahead and help an employee pay down their existing student loan debt, the uh, amount that you kick in towards loan repayment up to 5,250 will not be considered compensation to the employee. And that's essentially to provide some of your employees with some student loan debt relief if their salaries have been reduced and they're unable to make payments at this time. Um, again, another good way of uh, retaining some of your valued employees. Final section is acceleration of tax benefits. Uh, you may want to provide this information to your accountant or whoever handles your taxes. The legislation allows carry back of net operating losses for up to five years, uh, which is much more than it's been. You can see in the red if you had in 2018 uh, a loss, but you had a you paid taxes in 2013, you can go all the way back to then. In addition, there's an increased deduction for interest expense. I'm on slide 62, up to 50% of a, a taxpayer's adjusted taxable income. Uh, and finally, uh, they fixed a provision that had precluded uh, internal leasehold improvement capital improvements uh, interior at commercial businesses uh, that uh, was inartfully drafted during the TCJA. They fixes it fixed it so those amounts can be collected now uh, through business expenses. Tom and Kathleen, that uh, concludes our basic presentation. Happy to answer any other questions. Hey Russ, this is Kathleen. I just want to make sure um, I'm clear on the payroll protection loan versus the idle loan concept. Uh, the payroll protection loan program is intended to be fast tracked to get the money out quickly. Um, I think that's correct. And then the idle loans, um, the, the advance feature of the idle loan, where you could apply for an idle, a $10,000 advance under an idle loan, um, that, that feature of the idle loan could be something of a fast track feature. But if you took that $10,000 that would be deducted from the loan forgiveness amount that's available on the PPL. So the PPL is attractive because of the loan forgiveness. Um, if you go ahead and take the, the idle advance of up to $10,000, that $10,000 then reduces your loan forgiveness. Do I have that right? Almost oh. right. I, I, I believe you actually let's say that you're eligible for the $76,000 PPP loan, but you had a 10,000 idle loan, then you actually would be eligible for 86,000 additional for your total loan if you wanna roll it into it. However, that EIDL loan is not forgivable like the PPP loan. Got it, good. Um, and then just to be really clear on the FICA deferral, if an employer elects to defer the payment of their FICA, um, and they, they then also have a PPL loan. The, the PPL loan cannot be forgiven if you've elected the deferral. Is that correct? Well, the law just says you can't do both. Okay. But if, if you're going to apply 
this week for your PPP loan, hopefully you'll know before your April 15th payroll is due whether that's going to happen. Uh, and you should not do both. But I do not think that if, if a company actually just defers the payroll on one payroll session uh, for part of it and then get their PPP loan approved, I don't think you're not going to have your PPP loan denied because you deferred taxes before you knew you got them. Okay, and then for purposes of the employee retention tax credit, um, that's not available if you take a PPL loan, correct? That's correct. It's one or the other. Okay, great. Thanks. You know, and, and Russ, we've got a lot of questions about, uh, you know, and I really appreciate your helping us differentiate the paycheck protection loans versus the EIDL uh, loans, the, the traditional, more traditional SBA loans. There seems to be a, a lot of questions around the $10,000 um, uh, that you can get in as advance through the EIDL loan. Is that uh, in, in, in being forgivable? If, is that forgivable? And if it is, if you apply for that and the PPL, does that 10,000 get reduced from the forgiveness calculation in your PPL? Well, the way I see it is that if you, if you take an EIDL loan and you have an EIDL loan, you cannot, um, that EIDL loan is not forgivable. However, you can then apply for a paycheck protection program loan and, uh, you could potentially um, take out what you think your like forgivable amount is because of, it's the forgivable amount is that calculation of allowable uses for that eight weeks of payroll plus uh, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Everyone, as you can clearly see, uh, there are a lot of moving parts to this. Um, and for our inspired clients, I think it's important to, to realize that uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to bring this information to you as quickly as we can. I think the um, couple of things to make a note of if you are an inspired client. One, you will have a link uh, tomorrow that will be on your inspired landing page that will provide you access to the report uh, that you can then use to calculate the roll cost. We talked about what happens if you haven't been in disparity for the, the full year. Please check with your service team members if you have questions about that. Second, we are working on the technology development around the FICA deferrals, as well as around all of the different paid leave acts that we just discussed. So there's certainly a lot of uh, information that we're going to be delivering to you. Uh, and then the other factor is, as you mentioned, and, and uh, we are actively monitoring developments around the application process for the EPL. As you heard from our speakers, we expect this to be a fast track, quick turnaround process where the application is gonna be different or potentially different than the traditional SBA loans. And we're, we're actively monitoring developments in order to get you that information. Um, any other, uh, Russ, any last comments you would like to make uh, before, we, uh, before we turn it over, before we kind of conclude and uh, for your team and, uh, or uh, at, show the slide here for any last questions. All right. Well, in summary, all right, when there, in a time when there's so much uncertainty, the CARES Act provides us with an unprecedented opportunity. Uh, let's dig into our resilience. Let's choose optimism. Let's keep our people employed. I think there's no question that we can overcome when everyone cares. So with that, we're going to wrap up our presentation. Uh, you'll see here on the slide, if you have Q&A that comes up, we're gonna do our best to accumulate these into general topics. We've had a ton of questions. We're gonna get back to you. We'll provide summaries of that. We really appreciate you sticking with us. I know we went a few minutes over, but thank you very much and uh, look forward to speaking with all of you soon.